All right, welcome back to the negotiation lesson dealing in the 30-hour post-licensing course. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about something I hope you never end up dealing with. But if you're in this business with any amount of time, you will end up dealing with the difficult person or a difficult situation at some point in your career. Now, there is two different difficult people to be dealing with. And what I really want to talk about is negotiation with the other side of the table. That would be the buyer or the seller, opposite of what you are. It is highly possible that you could have a difficult client to deal with. That may be a whole separate situation in which you have to employ different techniques if you're dealing with a client of yours that is difficult. There have been clients before that I've dealt with that I've jokingly said after I get off the phone, I feel like I've lost five pounds with them um, because it takes all of it just to deal with that client. Um, that is something that we are probably not going to touch a lot on. What we're going to be dealing with here is most notably dealing with the other side and how you deal with difficult people on the other side. Now, the first thing I want to show you is a quote. Uh, I don't normally do quotes because then it requires people to remember stuff. But basically, uh, high emotional intelligence is the key if a negotiator is going to be successful. Now, I said high emotional intelligence, not necessarily high intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and to handle the interpersonal relationship very judiciously and empathetically, all right? That comes from the Wharton School of Business. What I'm saying here is understand that when you deal with the other agent, that you guys should exert a high control of emotional intelligence. I had an agent the other a couple years ago that got mad at me and was cussing at me and I finally hung up on him. And then I called him back. I'm look, look, are you done? Because the reality is this is not my offer. This is not your offer. We are simply the middleman negotiation. If your seller doesn't like the offer, I understand that. Have a discussion with them and whine and bitch and moan and cry and yell and scream. But when you come back to me, it should be with a high level of emotional intelligence. We are not supposed to get personally involved with this. One of the things that used to make me wonder when I was younger and I would see court cases and, and you would see attorneys arguing with each other in court. And then later that day, I, I saw them sitting having lunch together in the uh, city county building and it always you know, kind of boggled me at first that how these two guys were going at it and then all of a sudden they're having lunch because it took a while for me to dawn, dawn on me that because another agent is sitting on the other side of the table, that is not your enemy, that you cannot not have a good relationship with them or you can have a good relationship. Let's eliminate the double negative. When they are representing their client, they are doing what they are supposed to do as long as the negotiation between us is through a high level of an emotional intelligence. All right. So now with that being said, there are two types of counterparties you never want to negotiate with. You can always come to an agreement with the other side, but there are two parties that are just impossible. One is the emotional counterparty. Now, the good thing about this one is what I was just talking about. If the seller becomes emotional with their agent, you would expect the agent to distill that conversation and come back to you in a manner that is with high emotional intelligence, meaning that they are going to take that conversation and take all the cuss words out and all the tonal uh, inflectuations and just come back to you with an offer. So we don't deal a lot 
with emotional counterparties between buyers and sellers because of the agents being in the middle. That is literally your job, is to buffer the buyer and seller, okay? Now, if you are dealing directly with a for sale by owner, potentially then you have an emotional counterparty on the other side that you might be dealing directly with. The problem with emotional people or the emotional aspect is a lot of times they see the conflict as a direct attack on them and therefore they act emotionally or they may blow up and yell and scream. So you have to understand that that person is difficult to deal with because emotions are something you never know what triggers them. If you are dealing with a for sale by owner and your buyer writes an offer that you think's legitimate and they think is a lowball offer, they may have an emotional reaction that goes above and beyond what you should expect that to be. So emotional people are very difficult to deal with because now you're not dealing with logic or reason, you're dealing with emotions. The second person is an unreasonable party. Now, everybody seems unreasonable at the outset because that side of the table is looking at a different set of circumstances than you are necessarily looking at. They know facts about their side of the table that you don't. And if you go back to the negotiation type where I told you it was uh, competitive and competitive never really seeks to find the other side's issues, that would be the collaborative method. We don't use that. So in that competitive method, that person sitting on the other side of the table, you are going to say may seem unreasonable, but they are seeing facts that you don't see, which is always going to make them potentially seem unreasonable. However, there are two types of unreasonable people that you shouldn't deal with. People that alternate back and forth between conciliation and argumentative. You know, they want to say, yeah, okay, but let's do this. That typically is nothing more than a power play in the process and all they're trying to do is exert control over you, the time, the entire process, and they are very hard, if possible, to even deal with. So the people that alternate between the conciliation and the argumentative. Then there's this other type of person, and I'm going to boil it down to this. People that see straight black and white, good and evil, because a lot of the times they are going to see themselves as good and that buyer that threw the low ball offer as evil and they want evil held accountable, okay? What I'm talking about is somebody that may say, well, I'll show them or, you know, let's see if they can get away from that. I had a client most recently um, and I don't want to go into too much of the detail where we accepted an offer from a young lady, young single female, 23 years old, buying a house. This guy was in his mid sixties selling a house and the deal broke down. And for whatever reason, the young lady <clears throat> decided to not buy the property and she wanted released from the contract. Well, my client, and we can talk about this in a minute because we will cover this, I guess. My client literally told me he wanted to teach her a lesson and keep the earnest money. That was a prime example of an unreasonable party that was on my side of the table. He wanted to prove to her that she shouldn't have been playing in an area that she wasn't comfortable with and he wanted to keep the earnest money for the sole reason to prove a lesson to her. That was a very clear cut case of wanting her to be held accountable and he saw her as evil. Eventually, after several weeks of me dealing with my own client, we finally convinced him to release the earnest money and let the young lady have her thousand dollars back. Um, it was a situation of 
he was very much a, an unreasonable party to the deal. Matter of fact, he never released the earnest money until well after he had already taken another offer and closed on the property. And he did it for the sole reason of trying to show or teach her a lesson, all right? So that is something you need to think about when dealing with difficult people. Now, we are going to touch on, I guess, the, the issues of counseling your client uh, prior to a difficult situation. And what I mean by this is, if your buyer wants to write an offer that you may feel is on the low side, you might want to counsel them in advance as to what potentially is going to happen so that should it happen, they not be caught unaware, all right? And I have done this many, many times when we've had put offers in and I've tried to tell the, the buyer, hey, I think this may be really low, you're lowballing them. Here's what could happen. They could just get so pissed at you that once again, the emotional takes over that they just reject your offer. If they reject your offer, is there a chance that they may want to show you a lesson and never deal with you on a second offer? Because a lot of buyers will say, well, let's low bomb. We can always offer more. That is 95% true. There is a 5% of the population on the other side that may want to see that good and evil and entirely go, you know what? I wouldn't sell to that person now if it was the last buyer in the world, especially if that seller's in a position where selling is not a mandate. I mean, if they've got trying to sell it and they've got several offers on the table and you come in with a low ball offer, they may just say, hey, good and evil, he's evil, I'm good, don't deal with it. So you need to counsel your client in advance on what potentially could be an outcome. You know, hey, they might accept this, they might counter, but there's also that slight chance that you could be insulting and they're going to react in a manner, once again, emotionally, that's going to uh, guide their agent to come back to me and say, you know what, we've decided we're not going to respond to your answer. Um, have a good day. So you've got to remember that dealing with your client to warn them of potential outcomes when you start making offers or counter offers or get into that negotiation process. Now, I know that you're in the middle of this 30 hour post licensing course, which means you are within your first two years. You may not have had enough experience yet to deal with this. And as you do more deals, you will get better and you will tend to remember previous deals where you can tell your client, Hey, Here's what's going to happen on the other side. And then if it doesn't happen, go, huh, yeah, I was wrong. We got away much easier than I thought we did. That is a good job for you to do on your, hey, we'll submit this offer, but I just want to tell you, here's what could potentially happen. Here's the outcome. Here's the ramification. Are you willing to deal with that extreme outcome by putting this offer in? And sometimes that, that conversation could actually help you with your client when writing an offer. There have been many times when people have written offers that I thought were low and I've had that conversation with, okay, if we go with this offer, here's going to be the outcome. Are you willing to risk that outcome by putting this offer in? And in occasion, uh, in most situations, your buyer will come around and go, you know what? Let's add five more grand to the offer. Okay, now we're into a, at least a reasonable realm that they may have discussions with you. All right? So we're not done with negotiations as of yet. We're going to keep going. Hang around.